Welcome to Computer Science 340, Module 3. Now this module is going to mark sort of a turning point in the class because so far we've been talking about foundational things like how memory works, and then we spent some time talking about arrays and how arrayless operations are built and things like that. But today we're going to start talking about our first new data structure that you probably haven't seen before, which is the linked list. Now linked lists are going to be quite different from arrays in terms of the way that they store the data and the way that we access the data and things like that. And we're going to look at them because they have a lot of trade-offs with arrays. Things that arrays are really good at, linked lists aren't so good at. But some of the weaknesses that we've talked about so far with arrays, like how inefficient it is to add something into the middle of the array or to remove something from the middle of the array, linked lists are actually quite good at those things. We're also going to talk about linked lists because they form the basis of some other data structures that we'll look at. Both stacks and queues can be implemented with linked lists and also some of the other data structures we look at like binary search trees and graphs can be constructed with links. And so this idea of the linked data structure is sort of a big one in computer science. So this will be broken in, into two parts. We're going to start talking about sort of the basic foundations of a linked list in this lesson. And then in the next lesson, we're going to add some more sort of algorithms on top of it, like how do you remove from the linked list and do things like that. So let's go ahead and get started talking about what a linked list is. All right. So like I said in the intro, this week's topic is going to be linked list. We're going to start by contrasting linked lists with arrays. Because they're similar in some ways, they both store a sequence of data with a beginning point and an ending point, but the way they store them internally is going to be quite different, as we'll see. And because of that, the things that they're good and bad at is quite different as well. Last week, we, we talked about array lists and how to implement them with arrays. The, one of the reasons that I want to cover that is because it shows us exactly what has to happen when you do something like insert into the beginning or middle of an array. As we saw, the only way to do that is to scooch everything down to the right one cell in order to make room for the new item to be inserted. Likewise, to remove an item from the beginning or middle of an array, we have to scooch everything down to the left one cell to overwrite the thing that we're removing. Likewise, when we want to add to an array that's full, there's no really easy way to do that. The only way to do it is to make a whole nother array, copy everything from the first array into it, and then start using that as your array instead of the old one. And lastly, expanding or shrinking the array is not easy either. We saw that in your lab when you did the trim to size method that shrinks the array, but there's no like easy way to do that. You have to make a whole nother array and copy everything down into it. So these are all things, as we're going to see, that linked lists are actually better at than arrays. All of these can be done more efficiently without having to like loop through the entire data structure to do it. So let's take a look at how linked lists work. So with an array, you have all of the items being stored from beginning to end in memory. We talked about this when we first started talking about arrays. So if the array begins at location 800, let's say, and you're storing integers, the next item is going to be at 804, and then 808, and then 812, and so on. All of your items that are being stored in the array are stored contiguously in memory together, one after the other. That is what makes an array an array. Now, a linked list, on the other hand, does not store things continuously in memory. That's both the, the strength and the weakness of an array is that it works like this. It's the strength because it allows you to go to items very quickly inside of the array because if you know you want to get to the eighth item, you just start at 800. And then, as we talked about before, there's a formula that can give you the index of any item's location in memory. But that's also the weakness that they're stored in order. So a linked list, the thing that contrasts it from an array is that the items are not stored in order at all. So this is the way an array does it. With a linked list, if we have memory, I'm going to draw it horizontally like this, the first item might still be stored at location 800. But the next item, 57 in this case, is not going to be stored directly after the 23. It could be stored somewhere else entirely. Let's say it's stored at memory location 2200. Then the eight, likewise, isn't stored right after the 57. It could be someplace completely different. 
let's say it's way down here at memory address 408. And then the 42 could be stored somewhere completely different again. Let's say it's stored in here, sort of in between, let's say at memory location 1808. Again, of course, these memory addresses are totally arbitrary. We don't know or care with an array or with a linked list exactly what memory addresses our data is stored at. This is just to illustrate the concept to you. So now with an array, it's easy to loop through and to find your stuff because you just remember where it starts. And then if you wanna loop through it, you just continue on from that address sequentially through memory as far as you need to. Likewise, if you want to get to any particular element, like I said, you can use a formula to figure out how much past this base address of 800 you need to go to find the thing that you're looking for. With a linked list, that's no longer easy to do. Just like in Array, we're going to remember the location of the first item. But then after that, how do we keep track of the next item? Because it's not going to be right after the first item. Well, the way we do that, the only way to do it is to basically store that information as well. So in addition to this 23 here, we're also going to store the address of the next item in the chain. So we're gonna store the 2200 combined with the 23. And that tells us, hey, this item, the first item in the linked list in this case is 23, and the next item is at memory location 2200. So if you need the next one, that's where you're gonna find it. Then likewise, over here after the second item, in addition to storing the 57, the actual data, we're gonna store the memory address of the next item in the chain. So the next one is eight, so we're gonna store the 408 over here along with the 57. And these two items together are now having to be stored here at memory location 2200. Then over here at eight, of course, we have to store the location of the next item, which in this case is 1808. And then for that last item, let's say that's all that is in this sequence so far, that's all the data we're storing, we're going to store null here or zero for this last address. So in essence, what we're doing is we're remembering where the first item in the list is. And with each item, we're not only storing the data, but we're storing the location of the next item. So the 2200 here takes us over to this item. Then the 408 there takes us over to this item. And the 1808 takes us to this item. And then this is marked as being the end of the list when we see the zero in here in the very last thing. Now these addresses of the next item in the list are called links, which is why it's called a linked list. Now we don't know that the items are stored sequentially, so we have to have these links to take us from one item to the next over and over again throughout the entire list. It's sort of like if you think of one of those scavenger hunts, not the kind where you get a list of stuff and you gotta find all the stuff on the list, but the one where it says like, the first clue is in the place that is cold. And then you go into the refrigerator and then you see another clue that says the next clue is in something or other. And you have to sort of like follow the clues one by one until you get to the prize at the very end. It's sort of like that each time you see a piece of item, it has the location for you of the next thing in the chain and you have to jump around memory following the links one by one to make your way through the entire list. So that in essence is how a linked list works. It is a data structure in which you store the items scattered about through memory in any sort of arbitrary order and you use the links, the references, to keep track of which one comes first and which one comes next and so on and so forth through the end of the data. Okay, now next a little terminology. First, the beginning of the linked list is called the head of the list. It's for whatever reason, just by convention, not called the start of the list or the beginning, it's just called the head. Likewise, these links right here typically are called next, it's the next item in the list and then you go to the next item in the list and so on and so forth. And these pairs, which combine up the data along with the link to the next thing are called nodes. So you have 
multiple nodes making up your list, and each node is comprised of the data you want to store, as well as a link to the next node in the sequence, and you start at the head node. So let's now transition and talk about how we would actually go about implementing something like this in a Java program. Well, we can start by making a class called node. Again, each item in the list is going to comprise multiple things, the data to be stored, as well as the link to the next node in the sequence. So we're going to combine those two things together inside of a class, which again, we'll call node. And we're going to start just as simple as possible by making a program that basically does nothing but construct a very, very simple link list. And over the course of today and then the next part of this module, we're going to build it up and build it up and make it into a usable link list class. But we're going to start with just the most bare bones thing we can come up with, which is just this class declaration along with a very simple main that keeps track of it. So one thing I should mention first is that this next field is a node. And remember when we talked about memory, that doesn't mean that a node is actually stored inside of another node. Instead, they're just references. So if we go back to this now very messy picture, these next fields are just references to the other nodes in the list or a other node in the list. It doesn't actually store a node inside of here. So when you look at that, it's important to keep in mind, this is a reference. It's your pointer to the next node in the list. Then we have a main, which just does a very simple thing where it makes five nodes in memory puts data into them and then sets up the links in a certain way. So let's go back and draw this out and see what this is going to look like. Okay, so the first thing that we do is we make these five nodes and those will be created somewhere in memory. We're not going to assume, of course, that they're in any particular order. The thing about a link list is that they can be stored wherever in memory randomly spread out, it doesn't matter. So I'm going to draw these five nodes just in any old place. We have, let's say, this is A, this is B, this is C, this is D, and then this is E down here. And in this simple example program, we put in the values 10 through 50 inside of them just to have a simple example, 40 and 50. What we do next then is set up the links. So A's next field is equal to B. So that means that this is going to point over here to B. And again, the way it's really implemented is that wherever B happens to exist in memory, its address is going to be placed into this field here. But of course, rather than make up random memory addresses. The way that we usually draw this is with these arrows. So this indicates that A has two fields. One is called data, which is equal to 10, and the other one is called next, which is referring to B wherever that happens to be in memory. Likewise, we set B's next field to be equal to C. So that points down here. C's next field is equal to D, which points over here. D's next field is equal to E, which points over here. And then E's next field, if you look, we set equal to null. That indicates for a linked list that there is no next node after this, and 50 is the last thing that is stored inside of this linked list. So we haven't gotten here yet, but the benefit of a linked list is that because you're not relying on the items being stored consecutively in memory, now it's going to be easier to do things like insert a new node. So if we want to put something between A and B, we can stick it any old place in memory and we just have to fix up the links so that the list order is preserved the way we want it to be. So we're not there yet, but that's just sort of to give you an idea of why we're bothering with this thing in the first place. But the next thing we need to talk about though is how do you loop through a linked list because it's gonna look a little bit different than it did for an array. So to talk about that, let's pull up this program here and let's add in some code to loop through this linked list. Again, once we have this sort of like fleshed out more, we're going to make a linked list class that kind of keeps track of its own stuff. But for right now, we have this class called node with these two things inside of it. And we've made these five nodes and sort of like manually set up what the data and what the next fields are equal to. So let's add some code 
to print it out. Public void print. And a lot of the things with the linked list are going to take as a parameter the node that we're starting at. And again, that is by convention called head. So we have this method called print now that takes the head of the linked list, which is the reference to the very first node. If we want to print the first node, we're going to pass the first node in, which in this case would be called A. So now we need to think about how we're going to loop through this linked list. Well, the way that you loop through an array is by doing something where you have a loop and you start off your index at zero and you keep going until you get to the end of the array. It's going to be a sort of a similar idea here with the link list, except instead of keeping track of where we are with a integer index, we're going to keep track of where we are with a reference to a link list node. So current is what we're going to call it. Current is going to refer to the node that we're currently on, and it's going to start on the first one, and then it's going to follow these links one after the other. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's say we have a node called current, and we're going to start it off equal to head. Then we're going to do something. We'll come back to the condition for this while loop. And then inside of the loop, what we're going to do is we're going to do two things. We're going to handle this piece of data that we're currently pointing at. And in that case, it will be printing it. And the next thing we're going to do is we're going to look at the next field to move on to the next element. So I'm going to do something like this. I'm going to print out the current piece of data with a print line method. Then I'm going to update current to be current.next. This is sort of like doing your I++ in your loop if you're looping through an array. To get to the next thing, we set our current link to be equal to wherever this node's next field is telling us to go. We're following those breadcrumbs as we go through the link list. And now to talk about when we're done. When we're done, current equals null. So if we get through a position where we've set this last next field into current, and current is currently pointing to null, that means that we're done and we shouldn't go any further. So if it looks like this, where current is equal to null, then we're done. So I'm going to say, well, current oops, does not equal to null. Keep doing these things. And then to test this, I'm going to go ahead and call this print method on A, and let's see what happens here. So if I go ahead and Java compile, this is called linked list one. Oh, yes, I forgot that if this method is static, this method has to be static as well. Eh. This makes for a great video to watch me fix my mistakes in real time, but uh, yeah, my bad. All right, so now we can say Java linked list one, and it should print 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. So what our loop here is doing is it's going through all of the nodes in the linked list that are pointed to by current one by one until it hits null and then it's done. Hopefully that makes some sense. We'll get used to writing code that deals with linked list as we practice doing it. For now though, let's go ahead and step through this code to see while it's working. And for that, I'm gonna come back to this example here. Okay, so when we start, we're going to have a situation like this where we have this variable current and we have our list constructed like this. We don't necessarily know about the A, B, C, D, and E thing because those variables exist only in the main method. And inside of our print method, the only thing that we have is the data being passed in for head, which is this first thing in the list. So we really, we have head being a reference to here, and then we have our variable current. The first thing we do is, oops, I don't know what that is. We set current equal to head. So current refers down here. Let me use a different color. Current refers down here. Then we go ahead and say, well, current doesn't equal null, and it doesn't. It's pointing to a legit node. We go ahead and print out current's data, which is 10. Then we set current equal to current next. So we take the value of current, and then we look at the next field of it, which is this reference down here to 20. 
and we stored that in current. So now current is no longer going to be pointing to this one. Current is going to be pointing to the next one in the list. Current points down here. Then we go back to the top of the loop and say, well, does current equal null yet? And it doesn't. So we enter the loop body again and print out current's data, which is 20. And then again, we set current equal to current next. So we look at current and its next field, which is currently storing the address of this node down here, the 30 node. And we put that into current. Instead of pointing to the node 20, it's going to point down here to the node 30. And we go back to the top of the loop check if it's null and it's not. So we print the current data, which is 30, and then we set current equal to current next. So we're gonna overwrite this reference with this one here. Go back to the top of the loop and it's not null yet. So we print the 40 and then overwrite current with current next, which is down here. Current is still not null. So we enter the loop and print the 50. And then we set current equal to current next. Current next is null. So we're gonna overwrite current and store null inside of it. And then when we go back to the top of the loop again, current is equal to null. And so we break out of the loop and exit the method having printed out 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. So again, hopefully that makes sense. You can sort of step through it and see that that is what's happening. So now let's turn our attention to making a linked list class. In this example code here, we sort of made the linked list manually, making nodes like this and then sort of manually encode, putting in the data equals this, the next length equal that, but that's not gonna be super convenient to use. Instead, what we would like to have is a class for our linked list where we can just tell it, hey, add this thing, add that thing, and it would keep track internally of what the links should be equal to. It'll make it much more convenient for us to use. So now we're gonna start working on that. We're going to start by making a class called link list. And just like we talked about last time when we talked about array lists, we're going to make this a generic class. So we're going to put this type variable in here so that our link list can store any sort of data we want, whether it's strings or integers or whatever. Now I'm going to do something that maybe some of you haven't seen a lot, which is I'm going to make a class inside of another class. This can be done. This is called a nested class. And the reason for doing this is because the nodes here inside of our link list are only relevant to the link list class. Nobody else needs to know about nodes or to make nodes or do anything with nodes. They're going to be sort of perfectly encapsulated within link list. And so we put that node class inside of here and made it private. That way, the only thing that can deal with nodes are other methods in the link list class. Inside of node, we have the same two things we did before, except now instead of being integers, our data is whatever type the linked list is storing. So if this is a linked list of strings, these are going to be strings here. They also have, like before, the links to the next node in the sequence. Then a couple of more things. We, inside of this class, are going to store the head of the list as a private node variable. So this is our link to the very beginning of the list. The very first thing that we're starting off with is stored in the head variable. We also have a constructor that makes the list empty and to do that, it sets head to null. So if head is null, you don't have even one node in your linked list. And lastly, for our beginnings of a linked list class, we're going to make our print method which was inside of main. Now we're going to put it inside of the linked list class and now it doesn't need any parameters anymore because it already knows all about the nodes and stuff. And so it's the same code, the same logic that we saw before, except now it's going to make current equal to head, which is not a parameter. Instead, it's an instance variable of the class up here. But the logic for it is the same. It keeps looping through all of the data until we get to a null reference. So that will look like this. Here we have our class link list of type. Inside of it, we have our private node class, our private node called head. This is actually the only actual instance variable we're storing inside of this class. All we need is the link to the beginning, and then that one will contain the link to the next one, which contains the link to the next one, and so on and so on and so forth. Our constructor sets head to null, and then we have here our print method that we already talked about. So that's a good start. The only thing we really need to have something working here is a way to add nodes 
into the linked list? How do you add a new data element into this thing? And so in order to do that, we need to go ahead and make a method for that. So I'm going to say it's going to be public void add a type of thing called item. And we want to add this to the linked list. So let's go to the whiteboard and talk about how this is going to work. So let's say we have a linked list which starts out looking like this. We have two items in it, 8 and 12. The head refers to the item 8. The next field of 8 refers to the 12. And then the next field of 12 refers to null, indicating that that is the last node. Now, normally, if we were going to add something to the sequence of numbers, you'd say we would add to the end of the list and put it at the end. But with a linked list, it's actually going to be easier to stick it at the beginning because we only actually have a link to the beginning of the list. And so next time we'll talk about how to add to the end of the list. But for now, let's keep it simple and add things at the beginning because that's where we actually know where it even is in memory. So to do that, what we're going to have to do is a few things. The first thing that has to happen is we have to actually make a node. That'll be step one. Step one, make a new node. And so I'm going to do that by drawing a new box over here. The next thing we need to do is to put the data in because if we're inserting an item, we need to actually like store the, the thing that we're supposed to be storing. Otherwise, this is not going to get very far. So let's say we're storing, I don't know, uh, four, I guess that would keep with the pattern. We would actually go ahead and put the four inside of the node or Larry or a student record or whatever thing it is we're actually keeping track of. The next thing to do is to fix the link of this field here. So what we're going to do is we're going to point the new nodes next field to the head, which would make it look like this. This is going to point here. And then finally, step four is to point the head at the new node. Head to node which is going to get rid of this link here and instead point head down here. And now after this, we can look and see that this looks correct, right? Now we have head pointing to the node four, which points to eight, which points to 12, and we've successfully added this thing to the end of the list. So it's actually pretty simple, just these four steps. Notice that some of the steps can be done in any order, like we can put the data in after doing these other things, potentially. But something that is really important is these two steps down here. If we flipped the orders of this, we would actually kind of screw it up. So let's try it again and inserting a new item. We'll put two into the list now, but we'll do one, two, four, three for our steps. Well, let's look what will happen. We'll make a new node. We'll put the data in. Let's say we're storing two. Then if we come down here and do step four next and point head to our new node, then that's going to erase this link here and instead have it point down here to our new node if we did step four first. Now if we do step three next and point the nodes next to the head, well this node here that we just made it is equal to head and so that would give us a situation like this where it's actually linking to its own self. So there's two kind of screw-ups here. One is that we have now made like an infinite link list where if you tried to loop through this, you would just get two, 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 two forever. And the second screw up is that we completely lost this part of the list. We have no way of accessing any of these nodes in memory anymore at all. And eventually the garbage collector is just going to come and delete them all. So the order for these things is super important. And so when you're dealing with link list, I find it very hard to just sit down and code it and, you know, write the Java code for it directly in order to make it work without sort of drawing out a diagram like this. Because if you flip these two lines around, it is still going to kind of look right, but it's going to result in really, really wrong behavior. Okay, so I always like to draw pictures when I'm working with linked list or any of these other data structures that get kind of tricky. 
But for now, let's go ahead and come back to our code and implement this stuff. So I said, the first thing we're gonna do is make a new node, which looks like this. The next thing we're gonna do is put in the data. So I'm gonna say new node dot data is equal to the item being stored. The next thing after that is to set new nodes next field equal to the head. And then lastly, we're going to set head equal to new node. And that should do it. Now we have a main method that looks like this. We make a linked list of integer and instantiate a linked list of integer and set it equal. Then we loop through from zero to a hundred inclusive going by tens. So zero, 10, 20, 40, uh, 30, 40, etc., And we add them to the list. So we're calling this new add method that we wrote. And then we go ahead and call the print method. So this is called link list three dot Java. Let us see if this worked or not. Link list three dot Java. And if I do Java link list three, it looks like it did work, but it printed them from a hundred to zero. And if we look at our code, hopefully we'll see why that is because our code is adding to the beginning of the list. So the first thing we add is zero, and then we added 10 before the zero, and then we added 20 before the 10 and 30 before the 20. And so in effect, we're building the linked list up backwards right now, which is maybe not what we're going to want long-term, but this is the simplest way to get things started. So to conclude now, this linked list class that we've made constructs these nodes wherever they are in memory. Each time you call the add method, it adds just one new piece of information and the memory address that we're given is totally random and arbitrary. We don't know where they're going to be stored at all. So instead of storing them in order in memory like an array does, we store them wherever we want to, but we keep track of where we're storing them with these next fields so that we can loop through it. Our linked list class now can start off empty and you can add as many nodes as you want at the beginning of the list and then we can loop through and print them out. In the second part of this, we're going to talk about some more things. We're going to talk about adding to the end of the list and removing from the list. And so as we build up this link list class, just like we did for the array list one, we're going to add some new functionality and talk about the algorithms that are going to go behind implementing those things. So that's all for this lesson right now. So I'll see you next time. Thanks.